Hello, my name is Ivan Loredo Vidal. I'm very glad to be with you in this uh, 40th Congress of the Society, uh, Société Internationale de Rologie, the SIU. And I hope my talk with you is uh, of uh, significance and of help. It's called Never Give Up. I will talk about something that happened to me back in 2017 and also about other assorted things that, happened, that have happened to me uh, in mountaineering. And this is a slide about um, how to develop yourself in terms of leadership and in terms of uh, concrete experiences and also in not giving up. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's begin. Um, I'm going to show you some, some of the things I've learned. I, I'm sure you've learned in a very similar way in, in your own fields of expertise. I'm just going to show you what I've learned in, in my field of expertise, my way. So first one off, we have uh, Kurt Hahn, who was a, a, an international and renowned educator back in, well, 100 years ago. Um, he started the famous international adventure company Outward Bound. So what he taught us was about the human development zones. So what we have to do first is we have to recognize that we are, most of us, always all in, in a comfort zone. And we have to leave the comfort zone in order to learn a bit, because in the comfort zone, our learning is, is very limited. So we can see here from the slide that uh, there's low risk, but there's also low learning. And in the learning zone, the, me the risk is medium, but also the learning is medium. And the highest learning is obviously in the uh, outer zone, which is a high risk zone, which is danger zone. And, and this is where we, we want to be. As, as physicians, of course, most of you know that uh, difficulties in, in your case with patients, in my case with clients, when we are above a certain altitude and they can develop certain ailments, or things can go awry very rapidly. We have cerebral edema, pulmonary edema, which is a, a really bad case of uh, not acclimatizing to the altitude. And there's also, of course, the, um, the obvious risks of uh, avalanches, rock fall, of falling oneself, or maybe somebody in your group falling and then dragging everybody down with them. And this is really, really spooky for us. It's very uh, unsettling and, and harrowing. So, well, as, as we know from Kurt Hahn, and now we can, we can go to the, uh, to the next level of the development, which is the next slide um, in Kolb's uh, learning cycle. What we have to do is uh, accept the risk because we have prepared for it uh, by leaving the comfort zone and being in the learning zone many times, we are prepared for the danger zone. So we have to accept the uh, uh, having the experience. So this is what call, calls the concrete experience. And from there, we can, as we can see, we can go to a uh, process of a reflective observation. So we re-review re what we've learned, or at least what we've done, and learn from it. And then we uh, abstractly conceptualize what, what has happened, of active experimentation, which is basically the trial and error of everything we did. We go back to other different uh, learning experiences, and that's how we basically um, go out into the world, into our... Um, learning zones, leaving the comfort zone, and this is what prepares us continually for the danger zone. So basically, it's like an onion, but instead of peeling it um, from the outside inwards, what we do is we peel ourselves, our, our, if we want to think of ourselves as onions, but uh, in the opposite direction, we peel ourselves outward so that we can be more prepared for learning. And when we're at the outer shell, then that's when we when we are ready for the biggest challenges in our lives. So um, I just want to tell you about uh, going on to the uh, third slide. Uh, this is me and uh, a good buddy of mine from Finland. His name is Ari Piela. We are there in uh, Camp 1 of uh, Everest uh, Lotse. Everest is a big massif, which has uh, uh, another very big mountain next to it called Lotse. On that occasion, back in... Uh, the spring of 1997, I was I was actually climbing Lotse, not Everest, but it's basically the same route as Everest, 
up to about 7,900 meters, so that's about 90% of the way. And then I have to deviate to the right side to climb Lotse, and then the people who paid like uh, 10 times more than I did, then they deviate to the, uh, to the left side, to the South Gold, to climb Everest. Many people ask me, why didn't you just go to Everest, go to the left side? Well, first of all, ethics. I knew I was in Lotse, I wanted to try Lotse. Lotse is more difficult than Everest because the final 500 meters is a very steep couloir. A couloir is a, is a, is a nice ramp, a steep gully, and Everest doesn't have that. So it's more technical, it's more difficult, it's steeper, but it's obviously lower and not as, as famous as Everest. But I, I wanted the challenge and also it came at a much lesser price. And also there's people watching you, there's uh, liaison officers who are told by the expeditioners who paid a lot more than you did that uh, you decided to, to go to Everest instead of staying on Lotse. So when you get back down, they arrest you, they fine you, and then they kick you out of the country, and then you're banned from the country for five years. So this is why I didn't try Everest back then, and I just stuck to Lotse, which I did, and it was a, a good experience. I went without oxygen. Unfortunately, my friend Ari had to abandon the expedition a couple of weeks before our summit push due to personal reasons, so he wasn't able to accompany us to, to the summit push on that time. Um, let's go to the next one. So this is uh, me during exactly that expedition, uh, going up to Camp One. Um, it's just uh, for, for illustration of uh, how steep the route can be at some points. Obviously, we fix with uh, ropes so that we don't have to do this all the time and we just uh, use uh, what we call drummers or um, uh, basically uh, locking devices that we use to go up ropes. They're ascenders, basically. The slide that says never give up, and this is important for me because back in 2017, I had my first and only accident uh, climbing up a mountain. I have to uh, take a pause here and tell you that uh, in, in France, uh, mountain climbers, uh, guides, mountain guides, professional mountain guides, 30% um, of them don't reach the age, the age of 40. And that's because they fall and, and they die in the fall. And they fall not uh, through a fault of their own, but because their clients drag them down. So mountain climbing is inherently risky. Not so much dangerous, but risky, because you're aware of the risks. And obviously, I've been climbing for the last 30 years of my life. And I've been guiding groups in the Himalayas, both in, well, in, in, three, in three parts, actually, in Tibet, in Nepal, and in Pakistan which is where we have the 8,000ers, the highest mountains of Earth. And also in the Andes all over, in Bolivia, in Peru, in Argentina, Chile, Ecuador, in Mexico, of course. And uh, in, in Africa, I've guided Kilimanjaro three times in uh, 2000. That was the first time I had a client uh, back then. In 2011 and in 2016. Uh, in 2016, I actually climbed it twice on, on summit day because uh, first I climbed it with one of my clients and then I brought him back down. And then I climbed it with another one of the clients who was uh, coming, in, coming in very late because he was very slow. And other places, Europe, in, in, in the Alps, in Mont Blanc, in, in, in the Southern Alps, in New Zealand, in Mount Cook. So you can say that I have uh, experience in, in, in many... Um, different kinds of mountains. I'm not just based in, in one, say. And this happened in a local mountain called Pico Orizaba, which is uh, close to 19,000 feet high. That's about 5,700 meters tall. And I had this client from Central America. He was from Costa Rica. He had never climbed anything in his life. He'd never seen snow or ice. And for this particular volcano, which we call Pico Orizaba, which is it's, it's kind of like a mountain. It's very high and very steep. And it does have a glacier, and the glacier starts at about uh, 5,000 meters of altitude. And then all the way to the summit, we have to use crampons and we have to use ice axes, which he'd never used. I gave him a brief uh, summary of how to use them. You can't really give a class because for that, you need an entire weekend just uh, for that. And he didn't have the time. And that's uh, sometimes the problem we run into with clients, that we don't have the time to teach them and to take them mountain climbing. Mostly we take a mountain climbing and 
hope we can do our best to teach them in, in the process of the climbing itself. And that's also what happens with guides in Europe and elsewhere. So we went up and uh, it was particularly cold and freezing on, on that uh, November 2017. Many other groups had failed. Some had slid and, and broken bones. Uh, two uh, people from the U.S. had died. And, and we were aware of that. So uh, I was thinking we will go up to the point where we, if we can't go up any further, we'll, we'll go back down. And, and that's what happened. Uh, when, I, when I felt that the ice underneath our feet was hardening up, and because of the hardening, uh, it was dangerous to, to take a rookie up, somebody who was a neophyte and never done anything like that in his life. Uh, and I, I, I told him, he was a bit disappointed, I told him, look, we have to go back down because of safety. You know that there's been some accidents. So um, to keep it safe, to keep it clean, we'll go back down. So I, we started the belaying process, first down climbing. I gave him two ice axes, and I, have two, I had two ice axes myself. So we began down climbing, and then I, I belayed him down on, on a few points. And then when the steepening was uh, just waning off, when it was not so steep anymore, I thought, you know, we can just turn back uh, facing off the mountain and just walk down, you know, carefully. Obviously, we were roped up, and, and that's what we did for about five minutes. And then out of the corner of my eye, my left eye, I saw how he just slipped, didn't even try to self-arrest, and then I was dragged down with him. And I tried to, to, to stop the both of us. With, I had two ice axes with my with my ice axe on the left uh, hand and then with my ice axe on the right hand, but it, it was a mess. It was, it was like a pendulum just uh, dragging me down. And sometimes I was, I was facing head first and sometimes I was fa facing uh, the, the slid down the mountain feet first. So it, it, was very, it was very gutting, it was very painful because I was getting uh, pummeled by the ice beneath us, which was very hard, and so was he. And, but he was about uh, maybe 12 feet below me, and he, he was basically dead weight. He wasn't trying to stop. He wasn't trying to do anything, and I was trying to, to stop the both of us. And I knew that if I, if I gave up, because that's the easy thing to do, just giving up and, and seeing where you would end up, um, that's how uh, really bad accidents happen. And, and we would be crashing against rocks that were below. And I knew that uh, maybe we wouldn't be in, uh, maybe I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Or we would have ended up in hospital with broken bones and, and having to be rescued. And I really wanted to avoid that. So all the way down, and maybe it was 15, 20 seconds. I don't really know. But it seemed like a lifetime. And I was so tired because I, I couldn't stop us. And every time I tried to stop us, the ice axis kept ricocheting off the ice. And, and it was very, very um, strenuous for me, very fatiguing. I was totally knackered. And at one point, I do remember, I thought to myself, okay, just let it be whatever it will be and, and see what happens. But I remember that I have this friend. He's a speaker now. He's, he's quite famous himself. He doesn't have one arm. His name is Gary. I met him in Lotse back in 1997 in Nepal, and we've kept our friendship ever since. And you know where he lost his arm, his left arm? In Pico de Saba, falling in exactly the same condition, the same cir circumstance, the, the same situations. And his companion, his rope mate, he died, and he lost his arm. So I thought about Gary, and I said, no, this can't happen to us. I, I will not give up. So I kept trying and trying and trying until finally I was able to stop us. And we were all bruised up. I dislocated my, my right uh, wrist. I also hurt my left one. And I almost, uh, well, I really sprained my, both my ankles, but mostly my left ankle was really hurting. It was really bad. And when I got back home, I, I, I was all bruised, all, all purple all over. I bruised like a peach. Not that I bruised like a peach, but uh, the, the, the beating was so hard that I, I did bruise like a peach. And also my... Uh, left, um, I guess because of lack of circulation at the same time, my left ankle was, was also bruised up, very purple. So uh, this is the lesson I learned that time. You should never give up. So we should never give up when, when things are hard, when times are hard. In these COVID times, we shouldn't give up. We, we, if, if we're going to go, we have to go trying. 
So this is what I've learned and, I, and what I wanted to share with you about that experience. Uh, I have kept climbing. I have kept, in, in fact, uh, three days after that accident, I had another climbing gig with a group and I went and I did it. I told them about the fall I'd just taken and I went up all bruised up and the next week again and again and I've had, well, not a, not a hundred, but certainly a few dozen climbs ever since. And I, I don't really feel the worst for wear. Um, I'm ready for more experiences, not more falling. And I really learned from that. What I learned is that I underestimated conditions and I overestimated my capacity or ability to save someone else, in this case, my client. And that uh, even though I, I am strong and I wouldn't have fallen myself, if somebody falls, they can easily drag me down with them. So what I also learned is that whenever they're very, very rookie or lack the experience, I will tell them that uh, we shouldn't even go up. We shouldn't even be put to the test because it's not worth it for them and for me. Because there's many ex um, uh, experiences or, or many examples that I can tell you about or you can Google yourselves in which uh, people just don't uh, have a second chance. So we have to be very careful about that. So enough about that. That's uh, basically the, um, the thing I wanted to tell you about. And now let's go to um, happier things, happier moments. So here we are in, in this slide. It's the seventh slide. Uh, Mont Blanc Summit. This was back in 2016. I had a couple of clients that I, I took on that trip. Very nice trip in, in Chamonix. Uh, close to the border with Switzerland. I had climbed uh, Mont Blanc on my, uh, on, on my own by myself the year before in 2015 uh, in order to be able to guide it in 2016, you see. So first, uh, as a guide, we acquire the experience by ourselves and then we can um, take others because we know the way, we, we know what has to be done, what has to be avoided. And this reminds me of the words of Michael Yusim, who who was for many years the, uh, the director of the Wharton School in Pennsylvania. He has many books on leadership and he has this particular book, which I have, it's called The Leadership Moment. He likes mountaineering very much to give examples about leadership to executives. And in fact, the, um, the book itself has a chapter on, on, on Everest and Annapurna climbing, mountains in the Himalayas. And, and the front cover has a picture of very close to the summit of Everest. And his quote is, leadership is an acquired skill through the school of direct experience. So you have to be in that direct experience to be able to lead yourself. This is called situational leadership. You put yourself in that position and that's how you acquire that skill. So that's why I climbed on my own uh, Mont Blanc in 2016. So I, I was able to I would be able to, um, and eventually I was able to take three clients to the summit in, in 2016, a year later. And this is basically how I do things in Russia, in, in, in the Himalayas, wherever I go. Sometimes you don't have that privilege because it's very expensive to go on your own. And, and you have to learn on, uh, together with your clients in, in, in the expedition itself. Um, this next slide, in, uh, which is the eighth slide, we are um, actually Everest is in the background and I'm holding the Mexican flag, I'm from Mexico, the other way around, but I haven't been able to go back to Choyu, as, as you can probably understand, uh, to take uh, the picture again and to hold uh, my flag the right way up. But anyway, uh, I guess most of you don't even didn't even realize that until I told you. So this is show you, this is the sixth highest mountain in the world. It's, uh, it shares the uh, Tibetan and the uh, Nepali border. Tibet, uh, as you know, is uh, in China now. And uh, this was back in, in 1996, in the 28th of September of 1996. I'll never uh, forget that because my mother had died. She had passed away maybe six months before in February. And uh, I, I placed a picture of, of, of her on, on the summit. So that was a, a bit emotional for me. And also I had, I had pneumonia and I climbed it with pneumonia. I was taking uh, 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 meds back then. Um, in, in that picture, I wasn't feeling very well. 
But uh, anyway, I made it and I took it and I'm very proud of that picture because of what I just told you. Um, the next slide, we can see it's, uh, it's a mountain mo mo much more recently. It's a high mountain. It's a technical and an interesting mountain to climb. I also took a climb from Mexico and that was back in the summer of 2017. That's a selfie. Because my client is just uh, below me and the summit, as you can see, is a cornice just behind me, maybe 20 feet, no, maybe 25 feet uh, further. Aconcagua, which is the next summit, the 10th slide. Aconcagua is, is a summit that I've uh, climbed eight times. And this is the last time I climbed it. The first time I climbed it was back in 1993, always taking clients. In this occasion, one of my clients, uh, her name is Marina. She, she's from Canada. She took that uh, photo, that picture. And Aconcagua is, is a very nice uh, memory for me. I really like going there, and I hope I can go back uh, soon. Uh, now with COVID, we have to wait for uh, mountain trips because obviously, as you know, it's, it's not easy to, to make those kind of trips. Uh, the next one, we have uh, slide number 11, Broad Peak. That's, uh, that's, that was my first 8,000er. This is an in interesting slide because I climbed it with uh, Scott Fisher of the Everest 1996 disaster fame. Maybe some of you saw the picture uh, Everest in, uh, made in 2015. It's in Netflix. And, uh, well, I knew many of the people who, who died on Everest on that expedition. I myself was invited to Everest uh, that time, but I didn't have the money to go. And this is a picture uh, that Scott Fisher took of me, and, and he gave it to me. And we were on Camp 3 on Broad Peak, which is right next to uh, K2. And uh, as I said, it borders with China. And it's, it's in Pakistan and China. And this was back in August of 1995. And then we have uh, more, more slides. That's me uh, on slide number 12 on the summit of um, Chopicalque in Peru. That time I had a client from the States. Her name is Jamie. And uh, it was a good climb, it was a hard climb, but uh, it was very enjoyable. And this is me on slide number 13 on the summit of Pico Orizaba, which is a mountain that I have guided more than 100 times to the summit. And that's the mountain in which I had my accident back in 2017. Uh, the next one, uh, slide number 14, that's on the summit of Vallenarajo. And, and you can see uh, the snow-capped mountains of the uh, Cordillera Real in Peru, uh, Cordillera Blanca, the, the white uh, mountain range. And uh, here we have uh, the highest uh, and most dangerous of, uh, of that mountain range, which is the summit, the south summit of Huascaran back in 2008. This is uh, my client. Uh, his name is, um, uh, he's from Japan. Right now I can't recall his name. Um, Yukata or Yakuta, um, I hope I, I got it right. It's either one. Then the next slide, uh, slide number 16, the last time I was on, on Kilimanjaro. Um, but the first time I summited that day, which was uh, the, the summit day in which I summited twice. And in the next one we have, uh, which is slide number 17, it, that's me, um, an expedition member took that of me on Everest on the north side. When we climbed it back in 1999, uh, I'm ascending steep fixed rope going from uh, advanced base camp to camp one on the North Col. The next one is of me on camp two. Uh, that's uh, very high, 7,800 meters. You can see the summit of Everest with the plume of snow just uh, behind me and above me. And the last slide, slide number uh, 19, uh, that's us on the summit of Everest. Um, in front of me is my, my client, and uh, behind her is a Sherpa. And uh, next to the Sherpa, uh, there's a picture which is not very uh, clear of the, uh, uh, of the Dalai Lama. And behind it is Mount Makalu, which is the, the reference point that you're on the summit of Everest. Makalu is a, a, a mountain I climbed back in 1998, in the spring of 1998, with the uh, Catalonian team. It's much harder than Everest, and we didn't have uh, any Sherpas or any, any oxygen. And uh, the thing is, uh, with these slides, what I did is I took them on, on, on um, color reversal film, which is what a slide is, and then I transferred to paper, and then 
I scanned them. So that's why they're, they're a bit blurred and, and the image is not so good. So anyway, that's my uh, talk for you on, on this occasion. And I hope uh, everything is, is going fine with you back home and that things um, are being um, not so bad with, with these uh, difficult COVID times. And that, of course, I know you never give up. And I hope that this gives you uh, more reasons and, and more motivation not to give up. Let's not all give up. Let's all not give up. And um, and hope the rest of your uh, uh, Congress is, is, uh, is, is the best it can be. And glad to be with you. Godspeed to all.